Let our voices greet the Savior who gathers us, who gathers with us. Let us count this time of blessing, sharing with Jesus and with each other. Jesus ascends into the heavens, but never leaves us. We are Christ's witnesses in the world, inspired by God's Holy Spirit. Now coming together as this congregation here in person and also on Zoom, our unison prayer. Maker of all things, ruler of all peoples of the earth, we bring our prayers to you, prayers of thanksgiving and praise, and prayers of concerns and petitions. You have fed us with the bounty of creation and nourished us spiritually through your word. Meet us again in the special encounter of our worship, lest we forget the source of all we have, all that we are, and all we hope to become. Tell us where you would have us go to share Jesus' gospel, and may we find success among people who may discover the power and comfort of faith through our witness. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Amen. Now the singing of the glory of God. Who's, who's our princess today? What's, what is that? 
What was it? Sierra I, you know, I, it's been so long since my kids did uh, Disney, I, I, I forgot their names. Is it Maribel? Who is it? Okay, you look adorable in your, in your um, outfit like that. Very nice. So we're going to switch from princesses, princesses to space. Alright? Um, so we're going to talk about something that's called the InSight Mars Lander. And it's way, way far away, 34 million miles away. And the whole job, it was sent up there in November of 2018. And when it went up there, it had all kinds of power, and it was doing these really cool tests, um, Mars quakes. So earthquakes are when the Earth rattles and shakes and all that. You don't want to be in an earthquake. But when you get the same thing happening up on Mars, they're called Mars quakes. And so this thing has been measuring Mars quakes since November of 2018. Well, we've got a camera over there. And so now, the only problem is, is on Mars, there's a lot of dust. There's no water. There's a lot of dust blowing along. And so the power that the, that the, the lander has is from solar panels. And you know what solar panels are, right? That means that when something gets really hot, it gets a lot of energy from that sun. And way up on Mars, the sun is powering this, this lander. And the only problem is, all this dust blowing all around the place, it covered up the solar panels. And so now, only 10% of the light is coming through to reach the panels, and so it's running out of power. And by the end of the summer, there's going to be no more inside um, mission up there on Mars, because there won't be any solar power getting through because there's so much dust on the panels. If that solar lander, or if that Mars lander is right out here, we can all go outside and just blow all that dust off. It would be real easy to do. But since it's 34 million miles away, nobody's there. Nobody can get there. It just has to shut down. So sometimes when you think of up, oh, you think of far away, almost like impossibly far away. This Thursday is Ascension Day. And Ascension, there's that word ascend. And that just means rising up. And on the 40th day after Easter, it says the Acts of the Apostles, the disciples are there, and Jesus ascends up into the heavens. And I always get worried when kids hear that message of ascend up into the heavens, because we think of ascend like, well, he goes up, that means he's not here. And we don't want to think of Jesus leaving us on the 40th day. We want to think of Jesus being glorified on the 40th day, and not leaving us like that Mars lander that we can't even blow the dust off the solar panel. We don't want to think that Jesus is so far away that we can't have any interaction. And so even though Jesus ascends, let's not think of it as going away. Let's think of it as just not being able to see Jesus. Because for 40 days, the disciples could see him, just like I can see you guys, and you can see them. And then all of a sudden, he was gone. But it doesn't mean that just because you can't see him with your eyes, you can't talk to him, you can't love him, you can't feel him. And so, when we talk about ascending, don't think about it as going away. Think about Jesus being glorified and honored and praised. And so, because he's been glorified and honored and praised, Jesus can do whatever he wants. So anytime you want to say a prayer to Jesus, and you just say, Jesus, he's there. When you come to church, this beautiful place, Jesus is here. And anytime you think or do something good in Jesus' name, Jesus is there. So even though we're talking on the fourth day about Jesus ascending, don't think about it going away. Not like that Mars lander, but we can't do anything about it. Think about Jesus being really as close as our two hands when we say a prayer. Okay? All right, guys, have a good rest of your day today. Stay cool as you can. And today's special music, very appropriate message of worldwide peace. And from what I understand, it's one of our combined choirs.
Irish, and thank you, Anthony. Very appropriate message of worldwide peace. Let us now turn to our time of prayer. What's on Anthony? Did I get turned up as well? Is that what I'm hearing? Master Vine? Oh. Okay, thanks. All right, time for our prayers. Uh, we continue to pray after that hymn uh, for prayer uh, for peace in the world. And let's offer special prayers for peace in Ukraine. It's just uh, such a sad thing to see that in the news. Uh, these, these civilians and towns and everything else that are being killed and destroyed and, and for what? It, it's, just, it's just a silly thing. And uh, people in power need to realize that the rest of us are just calling these things silly. And it's, enough is enough already. And it's time for the world uh, to realize that, that peace has to be a better option. So let us pray for the people of Ukraine, the nation of Ukraine. Let us pray for peace in the world wherever violence may be. Let's also continue to pray for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. Two years this Wednesday marks the, uh, the murder of George Floyd, and from what I understand on the bridge, uh, there will be a standout uh, from Deerfield to Sunderland, people holding hands and signs at the bridge, and I think the time is 3 p.m. Uh, you know, is it 3 p.m. On, on Wednesday? She's going to check. Um, but the, the standout will be here uh, to stand up and stand out for uh, racial justice in our country. I won't be able to be there. What was that? You don't know? Okay. We're going to shoot. I think it's three. I won't be able to be there because we have another event in, in Hatfield um, that they're doing in conjunction with the schools and the community. Uh, but it's really important that we don't let these kind of sad um, anniversaries pass and just kind of paper over them. Uh, there is a, a serious problem in our nation and it does need to be addressed. And so let us pray that we may kind of heal these racist wounds in our nation that have been there for far too long. We also pray for the 525 million people who have been infected by COVID-19 worldwide, 83 million of them in our country. Um, and surprisingly, I saw that that's a 57% increase in just the past two weeks. So the numbers are definitely going in the wrong direction. So let us do what we can. And also, I think we have surpassed uh, the 1 million people who died in our country alone from COVID. So 1 million of our fellow citizens have died from COVID. So let us do what we can uh, to keep this, uh, you know, to help us suppress it and, and turn 57% positive uh, to 50% negative. And, and let's get back to uh, a more normal existence without all these masks and everything else. Uh, but we have to help them to get there. Are there any prayers that you would like to share um, before joy, celebration, then before we get to our yellow sheet? Yes, Reverend. Ninety-seven. Though. So your aunt Charlotte who passed away. We'll keep her. Gail or prayers. Lisa or Lane. Any other prayers out there, joy, celebrations, anything? No, I'm good. Okay. Then let us turn to our yellow sheet. No. Okay. Thanks. And here we're just using first names. So let us pray for Alan, Alice, Andrea, Art, Bill, Bonnie, Carrie, Cheryl, Cindy, Denise, Evelyn, Jane, Janet, Jeff, Jeff, Jimmy, John, Karis, Lisa, Lori, Marsha, Melissa, Michelle, Drew and Bart, Richard and Sue, Cheryl, Steve, Thelma, Minnie, Virginia and Richard, Wes, Wink, the victims of violence everywhere in the world, and those affected by natural disasters around the globe, and we pray for peace on earth. And let us now turn inward for just a few moments in the midst of our public worship and say to Jesus the things that we choose to keep quiet.
Savior of love and of peace, whose healing word is offered to every person and to every nation, we long to hear, see, and feel your presence among us still. Send your Holy Spirit to overpower our excuses. Lend new perspective to our troubled thoughts and equip us to walk into the future with courage because we believe and trust and know that you walk with us. Reign among us so that we may proclaim the good news to all who need to hear it, especially to those who suffer and to those who have nowhere else to turn. And when we turn to you in our prayers, help us to know that the words that we say, that they're heard in heaven, that they matter to you, that each one of us is known and beloved by God, and that you will make a difference in our lives, however those prayers are answered. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And they would now come together uh, sharing that great prayer that God, Jesus has given to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
in today's gospel is taken from John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And after this, there was a festival of the Jewish people, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool, called in Hebrew, Bethesda, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And one man was there who had been ill for thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying, and he knew that he had been there for a long time, Jesus said to the man, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. And at once the man was made well, he took up his mat, and he began to walk. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. This past Tuesday, I, I was at a meeting with a friend, and I asked him about a, a ring he was wearing. And he's uh, in the PhD program for engineering. And he told me that the ring is part of like a, an engineer's guild of some sort. And the steel of the ring goes back to the story of the Quebec Railroad Bridge. And I guess in 1900, as they were building this Quebec Railroad Bridge, they thought everything was all set. And as a train load of steel came across the bridge to add to the, the work that was ahead of them, well, the entire thing collapsed and 75 people died. And inspectors came along to figure out or find out that the engineers had miscalculated. They didn't count all of the extra weight of the bridge, the locomotive, and I guess the cargo. And so when that train went out there, it collapsed, killing 75 people. So 1916 comes along, they're rebuilding the bridge, and now they're about to set the center piece of this bridge in place. And guess what happens? The center piece collapses. 10 additional people die. So a total of 85 people have died now, and for the second time, the investigators find out that the engineers had miscalculated, and so that center piece of the bridge collapses 85 people die. And so I, I asked my friend, I said, why as an engineer would you want to wear a ring that reminds you that twice you guys miscalculated, twice your calculations were too small, and you ended up killing 85 people? He says, because when you got that ring on your finger, and you are doing your work, your calculations, it's to remind you to take your work extremely seriously, because if you do not, people will die. It makes sense to me. I guess that would apply to almost any job. And since we are now sitting here in church as the people of God, doing the work of God, and you know, I don't always like to think about church's work, but it shouldn't be an obligation. It should be something that wells up and wants to be expressed. But there is that idea that we can't also be too lackadaisical about it. We can't just say, well, maybe, well, maybe, you know, it can't be that kind of wishy-washy. There has to be some kind of commitment as well. And that's what I mean by work. Not like, you know, you have an obligation. If you don't do it, God is going to punish you. But there's this idea that it has to be more than a wishy-washy, well, maybe yes, maybe no. There has to be something inside that is a little bit stronger than that. So it's worth thinking about that. Go back to last Sunday's reading about Peter. Remember Peter, he's sitting in Joppa, a, a, a Jewish city, you know, Israelites, Hebrews, uh, people of faith, and then those people from Caesarea, you know, Caesar city, they come over, they knock on the door, and Peter has to be convinced by God with that thrice repeated message that all things I make are clean, there are clean and unclean, all things I make are good, and so he goes to Caesarea, he has to be pushed, because Peter's calculations just too small, They're too small. And so after that, we, we talked about also last Sunday, we talked about the three passion predictions. You know, the, 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 the disciples had this idea that, that Jesus was going to be a Messiah who was going to restore Israel, that he was going to make Israel back into the kingdom like when David and Solomon were there. And, and Jesus keeps telling them, no, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. And three times they would not believe because their image of what the Messiah was was just too small for Jesus. It was too small. The calculations were off. And like I was telling the children, 40 days this Thursday after Easter, and Jesus ascends up into the heavens. Now, if you go to Acts chapter 1, it's a little bit incredulous to hear this whole story. 
These are the people who are the eyewitnesses. They're the apostles. That's their definition. I saw with my eyes. So they have seen Jesus die. They have seen Jesus resurrect. If I had seen somebody die and then come back and then talk with me for 40 days, I think my mind would have expanded a little bit. Instead, the disciples, Jesus is saying, I am returning to heaven. And the disciples instead, when they hear that I'm returning to heaven, this guy who had died, the guy who resurrected, the guy who spent 40 days with them, their question, the last thing they say to Jesus on earth, is when will the kingdom of Israel be restored? This little tiny nation, 2,000 years ago, they take the Jesus who is ready to conquer the world, he's conquered life and death, he's ready to start a worldwide salvation, and they're worried about the nation of Israel and its politics. This is the last thing they say to Jesus. The guy who was dead, the guy who resurrected, the guy who was in 40 days, what about the politics of my country? Their calculations are too small. And then Jesus ascends. And like I told the kids, don't think of the ascend as disappear. Think of it as, a, as, as like another form of his presence, but not seen with the eyes. And as they see him disappear, they're all standing there like this on the mountain, looking. And after a while, God has to again send a messenger because they're standing there like this. They want to know Jesus was there, so I'm going to keep staring there until Jesus comes back. They would have starved to death, standing there like this, waiting for Jesus to come back. Finally, they got to be tapped on the shoulder. Say, hey, he, he's, not, he's not coming right back. You guys have got work to do. I'm going to send you the Spirit. You have got work to do in his name. Don't just stand here looking to where you once saw him. Look to where you are going to see him. And so that's the story of the ascension. These poor guys, they keep thinking to, oh, we'll get a brand new sermon now. <laughs> so, so you keep getting this idea of their ideas are just too small. Oh, I, I love that. Thank you. Anyway. I appreciate that. So, but this idea that they're, they're always trying to limit Jesus, and Jesus and God will not be limited by us. They, they may need to come along and push us, but they will not be limited by us. So, so Brenda read us that, that story um, of now Paul. You know, where does Paul come from? You know, Peter, he's got credentials. He was with Jesus. But this Paul comes out of nowhere, and he is the most successful apostle of them all. And he has no credentials. He says, I saw Jesus. Why? Well, how do I know you saw Jesus? You said, I told you I saw Well, so what? I can say anything. So how do I know? Paul is the most successful one there is. So you would think that his idea of Jesus would be bigger. And it is getting a little bit bigger. But Paul is from Asia Minor. Paul is familiar with the Middle East. Where does he go on his missions? Asia Minor in the Middle East. And he makes these trips to Asia Minor in the Middle East. And then finally, God says, okay, you've done good. Now you've got to go further. And he sends this like, vision. You've got to go over to Europe. You know, Christianity is not a European religion. It's an Asian, an African religion that came over to Europe and it had to be pushed into Europe. And so finally, Paul decides, okay, I'm going to go there. I don't want to go there, but God is pushing me there. My calculations must have been too small. So I'm going to go to Europe. And he gets into Europe. And where does he go? Philippa, named after Philip, the father of Alexander. Alexander, who came through and destroyed Israel. And now the Romans have taken over Philip's city and made it into their colony. These are the, the people that Paul should not like. And he goes there. And where does he go? He has nowhere to go. He doesn't know anybody. He doesn't know where to go. So he knows that if there are Jewish people here, they're going to be meeting by flowing water on the Sabbath, and so he takes a chance, and he goes down there, and he does meet Jewish people down there by happenstance. And the most famous one of them all is Lydia. And think about this. Lydia is a woman in a time before women's rights, and she has her own business. She's running a purple dye business. And then on top of that, when she decides to convert to Christianity, all of her family comes. She is the head of her business, and she's the head of her family. These are unexpected people. So Paul has gone to an unexpected place, and he has gone to unexpected people, and all of a sudden their small calculations are forced by God to get bigger. God is not going to accept small calculations. Small calculations are like that, that engineer's ring that only lead to disaster. And Jesus 
in the gospel, in church, in Sunday school. These are the messages and reminders. We cannot think small. I don't know if in your pews you got the Black Bible. If you have the Black Bible in your pews, try to find John's Gospel. It's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So it's the fourth Gospel into the New Testament. New Testament's way towards the back. And if you can find John's Gospel, you know what, boy, I got the same Bible here. Let me tell you the page number. That'll make it even easier. Page 866 in the New Testament. In page 866, which is the passage I read, you can see there John chapter 5. And John chapter 5, if it makes sense to you, you've got verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and the next verse is verse 5. Where'd verse 4 go? It's not there. Verse 4 is taken out of the text. It simply is not there. If you, you might have, you have a little footnote that says verse 4 down at the bottom of the page, it's down here, but the scholars who put that Bible together, they said that verse 4 was, was added later. It, 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 it's, it's extraneous to the text. It doesn't belong there. Somebody who was a copyist, was writing out the Bible, comes to John's Gospel and says, hey, you know what would be cool? What if we had this verse 4 story? And he adds something there. And so now it's been taken out. So if you go there to that Bible, you got verse 1, 2, 3, 5. In four, the one that they took out is this story about an angel coming down from heaven and stirring up the water. And as he stirs up the water, then if you're the first one to get into that water, God will heal you. That's not a miracle, that's magic. And so they took that out of the story. But think about that whole image of Jesus going down. There's five porticles, five porches. And all of these people are in desperate situation. They all need to be healed. But Jesus goes down there, and amidst all of his desperation, he heals one man. What about all the others? You know, that, that passage has bothered me for a long time. Why? Because I, I, I read it forward. Why is it that some prayers are answered and some are not? At least the way we would ask the prayers to be answered. Why is it that some people have almost like a miraculous cure, while other children are at St. Jude's with cancer? Why is it that we live in peace in Sunderland, but in Ukraine, there are children born into war? Why are there some people that are, are blessed with extravagant wealth, that they, they have so much wealth that they can fly off into space on a joyride, and there are other people who can't put food on the table of a child? How come there are so many people that are so blessed? How come there are so many more people that are not? How come Jesus goes up into those porticos and heals one man, and all the others are left. Jesus was trapped his fingers, they all could have been made well. How can we heal one man? And maybe, and I'm still working through this, because his faith is that challenge to keep growing. I still have problems with it, but maybe the message is, it's just like they pulled out verse four, maybe Jesus is not about always the magic and the miracles, but I can heal and cure this person. Maybe there's the message as a challenge that we're thinking a little bit too small if we want Jesus to do everything. Maybe by becoming followers of Jesus, we're supposed to be the ones that help to heal, to help to cure, to help the poor, to help the diseased, to help the ones in war, to help the ones who are in jail for no reason at all. We're the ones who are supposed to make a difference. Then all of a sudden, the expectations aren't just what is Jesus going to do. The expectation is what is Jesus' church going to do? What are we going to do as the people of God? And all of a sudden, those small calculations that lead to disaster, they're thrown away. And we become the people of God doing the work of God. I think that's something there in that message, because they pulled out verse 4, but I think that whole message of magic has to be done away with. Look at all the wonders we've done through medicine. Look at all the things that we've accomplished by using this, made in the image of God, this, this idea of how we are thinking people with free will. We could do so much more if we just followed the gospel instead of wasting our time and our money and making better bonds and killing more people. We can make a difference, but we have to make that choice. So just like that engineer's ring that was a reminder of thinking too small, calculations too small, we have work to do as Christians, and we got to stop thinking small. 
You gotta stop thinking that Jesus can do everything. You gotta start thinking about what we're gonna do. And may that be our prayer on this Sunday and the whole week ahead. This church is not this building, the church is us. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, if we could, our hymn of closing, if you're able to ask you to please stand, the hymn of closing is printed right here in your bulletin. And again, I remind you that if you're singing, please wear a mask. this uh, rest of this hot day as well. Now for our benediction and then our congregational response. Worshippers of God, we are called to go out into the world. We cannot linger here in God's sanctuary. God has work for us to do. There are people who Jesus needs us to reach out to. And if we have met God here, if our lives have been changed by God here, then these are gifts we cannot keep to ourselves alone. So may the peace of Christ go out with us today and always. May Jesus comfort us when our hearts are troubled or even afraid. May God's blessings be upon each of us all day. And may we be inspired to carry Jesus' saving power to the world. So let us now go forth to love and serve the Lord in all that we do among all whom we may meet. Amen. Amen.